The recent protests over the absence of an adult trauma center at the University of Chicago Medical Center have sparked a debate about the necessity of an adult trauma center in one of the country's most dangerous neighborhoods. I'm joined by two of the founders for Students of Health Equity, Michael McCowan and Olivia Woolham, to talk about the university's lack of an adult trauma center. Olivia, Michael, how are you doing? Hi, good thing. So how and why did the Students for Health Equity get involved with the, the recent protest on last Sunday at the University Medical Center? So, <laughs> it almost seems like we need to go uh, way further back in time. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, so the reason we're involved is because um, we began as an organization working on this issue with um, Fear the Sleeping by the Youth and Southside Together Organizing for Power and Woodlawn. So we didn't start, we weren't pre-existing until we started working with um, with these community organizations. So ever since Students for Health Equity has um, been around, we have been coordinating um, with Fly and Stop pushing this campaign forward. I'm sorry if I'm it's, sound it's scratchy. Fine. You're, you're fine. So that that's how you. So evidently, as the protest on Sunday was part of the campaign, um, we were absolutely part of it. Um, and you, you two were both at the protest last Sunday, right? So what what exactly happened at the medical center last Sunday? Well, so there's been a lot of uh, a lot of viewing of a video that kind of got taken. Um, once we were outside of the building. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would say what happened is that a bunch of a bunch of people arrived for the architectural tour of the new building, the Center for Care of Discovery, um, for care, the Center for Care and Discovery, um, which uh, is opening on February 22nd uh, in two weeks. And there was an architectural tour to see the building. Um, we showed up, and and the uh, the UCPD arrived. Well, within. well, what happened was, uh, yeah, people came. Um, there's about fifty. There's actually only people a, came to protest. There was yeah. a separate tour, and y'all came. There's to a protest. few dozen people on the architectural tour. Okay. Then there was. Um, about 50 um, youth from Woodlawn and some adults also as well. And these were all protesters. Yeah. And so we knew <laughs> that the building was going to be open because of the architectural tour. So and a couple were, of people bought tickets to go. And a couple of people bought tickets. So they were planning on doing a sit-in there in the lobby. Okay. Um, so they all go inside. Uh, we were outside, so there was one. Well, there were two University of Chicago students in the inside group, okay. um, and we were kind of uh, bringing up the rear, um, the four more of us. But by the time we arrived, they had sort of secured the. So the some, something that's so important we, so, to say is like okay. within within three minutes of their arriving in the building. Um, there were UCPD officers at the door, um, okay. making sure that we couldn't join them. Um, and so the the response was was kind of extremely rapid. Um, that mm -hmm. there there were, like Michael said, probably fifty people who walked in um, to to do a sit in in the lobby. And within three minutes of them entering the building, there were kind of UCPD on the scene already. So the Pro yeah. So the protesters used the the architecture tour. To get in a protest, correct? I mean, yeah. it, that was, that was, yeah. That oh, okay, was the, the okay, time just, just making sure we're clear. It was so, happening. short yeah. version is, okay, and the UCPD came and they started, would you say, forci forcefully removing people well, from the premises? I or? mean, it's kind of, it's, um, it was, it's weird how quickly it happened. Yeah. I mean, it's, I almost hesitate to start telling the story, especially since there's still legal stuff, yeah, I outstanding mean, legal stuff. There's, okay. there's four, three cases, like, okay. under suit for that, okay. so, yeah, I but mean, it, both but of it, us are going to be yeah. so, submitting So what, you, you were both at the protest, yeah. I assume. What, what, what were y'all thinking when, you know, police started kicking people out? Well, so, I was, I was very shocked. I mean, my, my interactions with UCPD have been, 
um, have been both through participating in this campaign and as you know, a student walking around campus seeing um, seeing UCPD cruisers. Uh, I live at 51st and Ellis, and sometimes a UCPD cruiser hangs out um, in this little cul-de-sac near mm -hmm. near where I live, and it's it's great to kind of feel like you have um, you have a presence, you know, in, in the in the neighborhood, kind of taking stock of everything. But it was really shocking to me um, how they responded, uh, just with with basically no um, coordination, as far as I could tell, and and very little communication. Okay. Um, I think part of the reason this went so um, badly is that so Toussaint, who was arrested was meant to be the police mediator. So he was supposed to be communicating with the Right. Police. Were, were, were you both aware? That pe people had planned on being arrested, correct? A couple of people, but not Tucson. Were, 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 were the people planning on being arrested? I mean, were they expecting some sort of reaction like this from the police, do you think, to go no, in there expecting not. to be arrested? No. So, I mean, so, so what you, were they usually, expecting? Typically what happens okay. when you have a sit-in, especially when you have a sit-in uh, in a location that is not... For example, the middle of a road. Okay. Right. So if you have a sit-in, typically what happens is you have a bunch of people sit down. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are willing to take a rest and some of them aren't. Okay. Um, the police give a warning, sometimes two or three, okay. um, saying, we, we will proceed with arresting if you don't move now, please move. Okay. You know, there's very clear communication about now is the time to leave. And if you don't leave, then the police arrest you. Okay, Usually so just kind of like, lift you up and walk you So the, the communication with the police didn't happen this okay. time. And we were already outside of the building and okay. they started arresting yeah. people. Okay. Too. Yeah. So that sort of confusing thing. And there was too. like very little clarity as to whether when we were outside the because they they were shoving people out of the building mm -hmm. and then there was very little clarity about once you were outside the building, they were continuing to shove people. Okay. But it was unclear whether it was sidewalk or private property and like where right. Everything and and like he was saying, the the communication lines just completely didn't exist because they had just uh, tackled and arrested the police mediator. <laughs> right. So, so what 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 exactly then was what what exactly did students for health equity want to get out of the protest last Sunday? Well, what we've been asking for a long time now mm -hmm. is is to have a serious meeting with top level administrators at the UCMC, specifically Sharon O'Keefe, who's the president okay. of the hospital. Um. To talk seriously with Fly and um, and other members uh, at Stop about what it would take to either open a level one trauma center or um, to extend the age of the pediatric so, trauma center to so, twenty one from sixteen. So why do you feel that it's the university's responsibility to open a level one trauma center? Well, I'll let you answer that. Uh, you have a better you have a better framing of it. In, in, I don't know if you read his article in, in Maroon. <laughs> um, well, why do I feel it's the university's responsibility? Um, who else's responsibility would it be? I don't know. Whose responsibility is it? That's what I'm asking you. So, there, nobody has any responsibility. This is kind of part of the problem. Okay. Um, no, trauma centers are not sort of um, regionally planned at all. I mean, there there is a regional director, et cetera, of uh -huh. trauma networks, but nobody has any, like, uh, well, yeah, the issue the issue is that, yeah, nobody has, there's nobody saying... Coordinating. Yeah, there's nobody coordinating with any kind of authority to say this would be actually the most sensible way to sort of form a trauma network. Um, it's mm -hmm. just like all of the hospitals of their own accord choose to join or leave the trauma mm -hmm. network based on how, um, based on their own decision making. So, most directly, it, it is sort of the UCMC's prerogative whether or not it would want to join the trauma network that it used right. to be a part of. Um, but is it, they don't have responsibility then, you're saying? It's their choice, but, I mean, they can if they want to. Is that what you're kind of saying? Well, I, I think that there's something really significant about the way that the university has, has reframed its relationship to the community over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, the construction of this building that we're sitting in right now, like the Logan Center, was opened with much 
fanfare about how it was going to be a space for Woodlawn, a space for the community, as well as a space for students and faculty to kind of participate mm -hmm. in the artistic and, and cultural life of the South Side. Okay. And I think that, you know, with the instigation of a lot of different programs, often led by, by really reputable members of, of the South Side community, for example, um, you know, the, the, the expansion of, um, of community centers through, through the, uh, through the actions of the Astor Gates and other uh -huh. people that the university has specifically recruited to be part of their expansion and their, their mediation of a historically fraught relationship with the community uh -huh. of the South Side, right? Okay. So the university starts in 1892 or whatever, right, right. Um, you know, comes to this area that has very little population and certainly not uh, the population um, that it now has, right? Uh -huh. um, and, and, and has and does many things over the course of a century okay. um, that that both that impact the South Side and the okay. political and the economic and the and the demographic trajectory of the South Side. Okay. And I think that the decisions that the university has made um, often reflect a deep a a deep concern mm -hmm. for the university's place in the South Side, right? And whether that is positive or negative for okay. Hyde Park, for the university, or for the surrounding communities, okay. um, has changed greatly over time. And right now, it's it's in a moment where it's expanding its presence in community uh, undertakings of all different kinds. Um, it's releasing community benefit reports at the UCMC. It's doing all these things to kind of promote its its good neighbor status. Okay, and and yet it not only doesn't treat uh, trauma victims, but it its emergency room has reduced the number of beds available to emergency uh, emergency okay. patients so, over the last couple of years. It goes on bypass. The, the emergency room at the university goes on bypass more than three times as often as any other. Right. So as, as I understand, in though, with, 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 in, the in, relation, city of Chicago. in relation to trauma victims, though, they can't turn any away. They're legally and ethically not able to turn trauma victims away. No, yes, they can't. They, they no, they can't say no to them. They, they stabilize them and they send them somewhere else. They can't say no to them, though. Um, so it depends so you, on the on the protocol of different not uh, no, paramedic uh, uh, situations. No. The medical law and ethics. <laughs> that you can't turn, they, they can't treat them there, but they can't say no. They, they, they have to stabilize them and send them to another trauma center. Well, I mean, and that's, that's we'll, the way things have been going for a long time, but increasingly, especially with the UCSC, okay. LA County um, Trauma Center, like model, okay. it's it's becoming more and more apparent that just getting people to the to a trauma center quickly is much more effective uh, in saving lives well, than the, stabilizing people. At the, the supposed first. golden hour for getting victims to a trauma center is twenty minutes. I mean, if you get them there in ten minutes, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, as long as you get them there in twenty minutes, it's it's considered that's considered the best time frame to get them so there. So the golden hour is twenty minutes. Golden hour. I so think the phrase. golden hour is actually referring to a little golden hour. hour. Yeah, I mean, and that's golden and that's hour. a national and that's a national right. standard. Right, twenty that, like, minutes is the first twenty minutes are considered the best time to get someone there as it does to people. In so America. obviously, yeah. the in faster general, the better, right? Like if you're in twenty out in, in, in twenty minutes, it's considered yeah. the same. Ten twenty, I mean, ten fifteen minutes are considered. That's the safe zone. I should have said. And the okay. safe zone. Well, wait, hold on. Yes, and the safe zone. So, I think. I was doing a little research on this. Most of the south side is within a 20-minute safe zone. I think easy access is 20 minutes. So most of the south side is considered to have easy access to a trauma center. So what then, because the university hospital already provides a bunch the of... University, the university and their hospital. own statement says that everybody is within the city of Chicago 32 minutes. No, they, they, say, they say most are within 20 minutes. The median for the south side was 15 minutes. The farthest one from the south side is 32 minutes. That's what they said in the statement. So, what do you mean the farthest one from the, the farthest one, like the farthest, like trauma center, or the farthest people from a trauma center in the south side are 32 minutes? Well, but they said you, the median was you, 15. If you've given me a moment to, to look this up, I do have some statistics that were done by WBEZ last summer. Okay. Um, and they and they tracked uh, travel times from different parts of the south side, different zip codes to um, to trauma centers, and I can't remember right now. Um, there were there were a couple, I'm not going to say the numbers because I don't remember them right okay. now, but there were, so travel times from the south side to trauma centers are some percentage greater than any other part of the city, and then some percentage of travel times from the south side um, to trauma centers 
is over some number of minutes. That was around 40. But like I said, um, I don't have the also, numbers. So, so two things I'd want to point out about that. Okay. Is that the actual center of population... <clears throat> I'm sick. <laughs> it's, it's really <laughs> the actual center of population mm -hmm. for the sort of southern region of Chicago land is a lot further south than just say the Chicago city limit. Okay. Whereas like tens to hundreds of thousands of people live south of Chicago city limits. Okay. Northwest Indiana, etc. None of them are any closer to trauma centers. So if you want to just talk about Chicago, you're really sort of cutting out a whole section okay. of like Fair. people who would need these services. Second point, so if you're talking about average travel times, if on average everybody is within, say, 32 minutes, that means that 50% of the people are on the other side of the average and they're further than 32 minutes away. So what the, there, there's no disputing that, I mean, a trauma center is a drain on hospital resources, right? I mean, it's, yeah, you have to pay for it. You have to you know, make room for the victims. They, they come in, correct? Well, but you could make that argument about anything, right? You, you like could, but so well, what, what I'm going resources. to ask is what, what do you propose that the university hospital kind of, you know, peel back on to, to give more, you know, to have a trauma center? What, what I mean, the helicopters, the burn unit, the, the baby intensive care, what, what, what services do you feel like should be scaled back in order to, to have a trauma center? That's a silly question. Why is that a silly question? <laughs> because nobody... Because nobody how am I supposed to answer that? I don't know what the unit... I don't have access to the UCMCs. Well, the the um, university says they can't have a trauma center because it would divert too much resources from pre-scheduled surgeries, um, their burn unit, their helicopter... Well, so so I think to go, here, to go back to your question about like how Students for Health Equity got involved in this trauma center campaign to begin with, right? Your first question. I mean, if we go back to that, our campaign last year was larger, largely around trying to answer that question, right? Okay. Trying to ask the University of Chicago Hospital to run a feasibility study to find out, first of all, how much would it actually cost to run a tra uh, to run an adult level one trauma center, and second of all, where that funding could come from, right? Okay. And some of it might come from other programs, but there is no reason that it should have to come entirely or even largely from other programs that the hospital already has. Yeah, so so just, just so for instance, the $700 million that they just outlaid on mm -hmm. this building, did that money come from the burn unit and the neonatal and the blah, 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 blah? I mean, that money came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and if that money came from the burn unit and the neonatal unit and blah, 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 mm -hmm. then I think we have a serious problem on our hands because not only is it not a trauma center, but it's not any, but it's, you know, money it's not that could be going to a trauma center, is what you're saying. No, it's, it's money that could be going to other essential services. Yeah. Okay. Instead, going yeah, so, into capital improvements, so, like a really so, nice new hospital with a wolf camp. So if that's really, so if that's really sort of, so it's just, it seems to me very clearly that it's, it's not really the choice that we have to be talking about making. Okay. If they wanted to build a trauma center they could appropriate that capital just like they appropriated the capital to build the other building. Okay. Um, yeah. So what, what I, we're almost done here. I know there, there are other events planned. We, we'd speak, we'd spoken earlier, uh, other events planned between she and other, the other groups around the neighborhood to raise more awareness about this. What, what other kind of stuff are y'all planning on doing in the future? Well, on Tuesday we have, um, so Michael was talking earlier about how, uh, the population center of the south side of Chicago goes mm -hmm. further south than perhaps the um, the actual city limits of Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, one of one of those one of the unifying threads between the south side of Chicago and the southeast side of Chicago um, is the second congressional yeah, district and of the Illinois suburbs. and the southern suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. So the second congressional district of Illinois, which until recently has been filled by Jesse Jackson Jr. Um, he is now retired, and uh, and his seat is open, and they're having a special election, um, the Democratic primary of which is on February 26th. Um, so we were contacted by uh, one of the candidates who's running for that seat, um, who said that a lot of um, the constituents on, on the south side of Chicago, but also on in the south suburbs, in the southeast suburbs, um, really feel strongly about not having access to trauma care. Okay. Um, because, you know, they are that much further away from Northwestern mm -hmm. and they're that much further away from Christ and et cetera. Mm -hmm. If you look at a um, at a map of the Manhattan travel times of different uh, lengths of, of of transit from from 
parts from zip codes on the southeast side to trauma centers, the the southeast side of Chicago, um, which is exactly within uh, the second congressional district, is the hardest hit. Um, and so, so we're having a panel for can, uh, congressional candidates, the Democratic congressional candidates for the second district of Illinois next Tuesday in Kent. Okay, and, and how optimistic are you guys that the university is actually going to listen to and consider these protests, these panels you're having? You know, how how optimistic are you that they'll respond? Uh, well, they're obviously not responding. <laughs> well, they're responding without responding. You know, I mean, I, I well, had they a, did. I had a we, there was a great the great email that we got on on what was it Tuesday um, that that identified. Um, you know, the UCMC, the, sorry, excuse me, the UCPD's inappropriate response mm -hmm. um, in a number of, of rather um, kind of peripheral ways, right? It kind of skirted, skirted the question of whether UCPD had responded in un operating on any kind of protocol and how... Um, University police is meant to interact with students and non-students, mm -hmm. um, and obviously that is something that's that's generated a response from from students, which they're responding, which they are responding to. Um, I think, I mean personally, I think that it would be a shame if this moment of, as I was saying earlier, um, the university really putting out a lot of a lot of energy and resources and. And I think real emotion to try to to try to engage with this outside mm -hmm. um, as its as its place, right? We have the Chicago Studies Department. We have um, you know all of these great programs that that attempt to connect students with Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it would be a real shame if uh, the continuation of of what is happening now, what happened on Sunday, um, if that continued. The trend of not of explicitly not engaging mm -hmm. with very engaged members of the community. Um, and in terms of getting a, a trauma center, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in terms of getting a trauma center, I think that it would be good to see the university uh, sort of. Uh, I mean, they have a lot of clout. I mean, they're a huge economic engine for this sort of whole region, um, and they have lots of ties. As somebody, as somebody mentioned, you know, they have uh, they have political um, mm -hmm. allies that go right. all the way to the White House. So, if the UCMC is serious about not opening a trauma center, I think that they ought to be seriously looking into how do they um how do they help construct an actual like regional plan for opening um a trauma center on the south side because it is a needed service in this part of the city and obviously like Jackson Hospital or Provident Hospital I mean doesn't have the capacity to do to do that themselves, um, so so I think that they need to take if they're serious about not opening a, a trauma center in their own hospital, mm -hmm. they need to take the actual issue of access to trauma care seriously as a as a as a serious regional player, um, which is what they like to present themselves as <laughs> as okay. a very serious right. important hospital. Except when you want them to do something, and then it's like, well, we're the total victim here. We don't have any money. Like, what are we going to do? Okay. Um, and so they need to decide which one of those things they're going to be, and then they need to, to sort of follow through. Because I don't, I don't think that, um, yeah, I just don't, I don't think that they get to, they get to do both. All right. Well, Olivia, Michael, thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming by today, and uh, that's it. Mm -hmm.